Hey guys, and welcome to the third volume of Primp Your Slide, where I make over your crappy charts and stinky slides. Today's challenge comes from Jennifer Yacenda of Starwood. She is a fantastic speaker and one of my private coaching clients. So she's just awesome all around. Now, Jennifer submitted a doozy of a visualization for today. So let's hop on over to see what she said and Primp a Slide What? Jennifer writes, the goal of this slide is to communicate with our senior executive audience to highlight the performance of our digital channels. We have four core channels. As the world expands digitally, every level of the organization is curious on regular updates of how fast and how big this channel is becoming. I personally find the formatting of this slide busy and there's no room to expand to more than one slide. So thanks for such a detailed description, Jennifer, and we're gonna take a look at what she sent in and oh, goodness golly gee <laughs> there's a lot going on here brain hurt all right sorry I'm, I'm having a little too much fun with this but seriously there's a lot going on there and she knows it which is great that she sent it in so we're going to take a closer look at exactly what's going on on just one of the modules that uh, is on her view okay so this is just one of the modules. I chose channel A as an example. Now keep in mind this is extremely dumbified data and um, I'll show you in some ways um, how I had to change that to make it work for this exercise. But basically at the top, worldwide year-to-date digital channel revenue. This is for channel A. They put some highlights underneath. First thing is the bars. So the bars represent current monthly revenue. Then this purple line is the projected percent year-over-year -year growth. So they set a one-time flat annual target for projected growth um, against the prior year. And finally, this red line down here reflects the actual year-over-year -year growth every month. Now, something that you'll notice is that both of those projected and actual growth lines are flat. This was a result of the dumbification, if that's a word, of data. Um, so I, uh, I have manipulated the data a bit to make this example more representative, which you'll see. So uh, taking a closer look at this, I identified a couple of issues with the cognitive prowess of it, if you will. So here are a few things that I noticed. First, there's a lot of visual noise happening. It's not the worst that I've seen by any means, but there's definitely room to clean up. Second, we have dual axes and they are on different scales. This uh, it was something that I pointed out in my most previous episode, um, volume two of Primp Your Slide, that was episode eight, if you'd like to check that out, where uh, different scale dual axes charts can sometimes be misleading and create correlations where there really is none. So I do have a solution for that. And finally, these target bars and labels uh, I'm sorry, target lines and labels interrupt the bar graphs. So bar charts require by nature to be your to have your eye follow them to the base axis in order to be interpreted correctly. That is the entire foundation of how a bar chart is interpreted. And when we, these lines and these labels interrupt them, you're basically interfering with the absorption of that bar. So um, finally, we have this red line. So in our American culture, we tend to use red to indicate something bad and green to in indicate something good. But unfortunately, a lot of the default Excel palettes and other visualization tools include both of those colors in an arbitrary fashion. So these are just a few items that I've picked out for revamping. And I'm going to take this bad boy through the whole thing called the PICA methodology, which if you've seen my prior Primp Your Slide episodes, you'll be familiar with this. Why PICA, if you're not familiar? Well, I'm not terribly creative at naming things and uh, all the letters seem to fit, but mostly I sort of just want my married name to mean something other than a unit of type and size and line length equal to 12 points. It's really exciting. Some people's last name mean like White Hawk of Battle, and, and, and that's what I got. And I, I don't really have much of a visual for you on that one. So we're going to move on. 
Anywho, so we're going to start with the very first letter in the methodology, which is P, and that's P for purpose. We always want to ask every visualization that we create, what is your purpose in life? Why do you exist? It's very important. So if we're going to look at this, there's a couple of questions that came through in her original submission. Identify them as how is each channel's revenue trending over time? And how is each channel performing against its target? Very important things to understand. Now, in looking at this and every visualization that I look over, I actually go back to the source data because I'd like to see what I can do with that original data. So here's a look at the original dummified data. This was how it was structured. I immediately noticed a few things about the structure that could be improved. So it's just some initial drawbacks that I found were there were redundant elements over and over. So for every channel, the date is repeated, the dimensions, I'm sorry, the metrics are repeated, and they're all split. Um, this is, makes it challenging. You know, these discrete areas really aren't scalable. If you continue to add more channels, it's going to get a bit unruly to manage with discrete areas like this. And finally, should I have a probing question from one of my stakeholders, this data isn't possible to pivot for further analysis and stretching and pulling. It's The structure as it is makes for a very confined visualization con experience. So one of the first things I did was I reshaped the data into more of a tabular format so that I could work with it a little bit more easily. I also created variation in the actual growth rate to simulate a more realistic scenario. So I, I just had a little free license with that. So this is um, also creating a table is super useful because if you're creating formulas in your table, they automatically populate down. So that's super important. So the purpose first was to understand how each channel is trending. So what I did was I took each block and I'm rebuilding it from scratch essentially to ensure we're achieving that purpose. So here is that block. Um, I just took the section for channel A and we've created a simple bar chart as it was before. Um, just a little cleanup thing. I take away the chart title because it bothers me. But what I add back are data labels. This is really important for understanding what's happening with each bar and I'll show you why it's important uh, in the aesthetic session, section as well. So now I'm starting to create that dual view. So instead of having one bar chart with a dual axis line chart overlaid, I've separated the chart into two pieces. So now we can see the actual volume at the bottom but I've created an area where I can see the performance variance on top. I want to keep these areas a little bit separate so that the trends in each aren't interfering with the interpretation of each other. So what I did is I just included a quick bar chart. So the purple is the flat projected monthly target and then that blue is the actual growth year over year. And now what I did is I just changed that top variance to a line chart. So now we can see our target as a flat line and how our growth varied depending on the month that it is. Now that we can see them separately like this, they won't interfere with each other and it won't cause a correlation interpretation by accident. Now, I thought that I could actually improve the lower bar, the volume bar chart, even a little bit more by adding a little something extra. So I went back to my reshape data and I used a couple of the metrics, projected growth rate and actual current revenue and actual growth rate to arrive at a projected revenue. So what revenue whole number target were we supposed to meet every month? Um, the value, again, this is where converting and reshaping that data into this tabular format makes creating these metrics extremely flexible and scalable. So that's why I do it that way. So now that I have projected revenue as a whole number, I've added that to the chart as a second bar. So it's not terribly useful in this format. I'm not a huge fan of clustered bar charts. It's hard to get the nuance. Um, and in this particular example, the variance of projections are pretty small, so it's a little tougher to see. 
but basically what I want to do is make this a little more easier. So what I am going to do, even though I just said not to do this, is I'm going to put that projected revenue on a secondary axis. I'll show you why this is okay in just a moment. But first, let's make sure that we can see it. So, uh-oh, where'd you go? <laughs> um, now, unfortunately, our little guy is hiding behind the main bars, so we can't really see uh, the projected revenue if our actual revenue exceeded it. So what I did was I changed this chart to a line chart. Now, I don't recommend keeping it that way. I still don't love this view. So what I did here, something a little bit different, I went to format my data series and I went to my marker. First, I removed the line. So removing the line just leaves you with each marker above the data points. And then I changed the type of the marker to be a little line. And you'll see what happens right now. So now you can see that these little lines are serving as a little bit of a thermometer gauge, if you will. And I think it adds a little bit of extra context. I mean, we what the data is saying is that we are very close to hitting our targets every month, which I think is good news. But it could be just a little bit of an extra hint that you include on the bar chart to help for that. Now, before I said that dual axis charts are no K, so why is this one okay to go? That's because they have the same scale. On a recent podcast episode I just taped with Cole Newsbomber Naflik, who's my personal hero of DataViz, she explained one case where dual axes are okay, and it's if they share the same scale. So in this case, since we're on the same scale, it's okay to show it because the relative volume is the same. There won't be anything misleading. So that explained a lot for me, and I hope that's useful for you. Okay, so we've gotten through the purpose, essentially. I'm actually going to skip over the I <laughs> just this one time because sometimes I'm finding that insight, uh, there's a spoiler alert, insight is often comes at the end. You know, it's after we've gone through putting in the purpose, getting the next le few letters, the insight comes at the end. So I'm going to essentially for the exercise, rearrange the letters a bit. So we're going to move on to context, but we'll come back to insight, I promise. Now, context. Context is really important because you never want to make any data assessments in a vacuum. So there is another question that I thought of asking, which wasn't completely stated in the original submission, but I would find this interesting. And that is, how is each channel performing against the others? Now, I know that we don't have room to include this on that original space because we're going to be using all four of those spaces for the new uh, chart and uh, bar chart and line. But if there was an opportunity to present a different view to kind of lead into that one big view, I would suggest a variance bar chart. This is something I read about in Show Me the Numbers by Stephen Few. And first, I'm going to show you what you'll need to do with the actual data in order to set up for the variance bar chart. So here we are with our reshape data again. So I added two new sections, which were actual prior revenue and the target variance. So these are really important. And the main one that we're going to look at is target variance. OK, so let's uh, go here. And what I did now that I have this table is I'm able to generate a pivot table from this Ooh, fun. And I'm able to see more of a bird's eye view of how each channel is doing for the year. This might be great for like a quarterly check in with your stakeholders. So this is definitely some extra context credit. And here is the target variance bar chart. Very, very simple. But basically that target line for all four channels has been normalized to zero. And the variance that each channel is experiencing shows above or below, essentially. And this is just fantastic for getting a read on the pulse of how each channel is doing that is going to be missed by that larger, much more detailed view. Now, if you want some extra, extra context credit, you can actually start to break this down a little bit and understand what's happening over time at this bird's eye view with a target variance trend. Nice. 
So here we have each of the channels variance, but by month. So this explains a little bit more about the peaks and valleys of what's happening over time. So these are two views that if you had the opportunity to throw them a little something extra to set up the story going into the larger view, these would make a great choice. So now you may have noticed the last couple of charts look a little bit fresher and cleaner and simpler. And that is a perfect lead in into our next letter of the methodology, which is aesthetics. This is the fun part that everyone loves the design. Now doing chart aesthetics right means doing something that is very near and dear to my crunchy granola alter ego, and that is chart detox. This is a very important aspect of effective data visualization. And I'm gonna take you through my chart detox checklist step by step, but if you'd like to get a printable copy of your own, if you sign up for my newsletter, you'll receive my very own chart detox checklist, it's tough to say, in your inbox that you can use anytime for reference. So let's uh, let's get detoxing. So these bars are looking a little bit hungry, so we wanna feed them like a burger or something. So if we're gonna change the gap width to 50%, that looks much better. And we're gonna take those little lines and just make them a little bit wider too so that we can see it. I also made the upper line chart line a little bit wider as well. The next thing is I remove the grid lines and axis lines. It's really just extra visual noise that you don't need for interpretation. Now, I've also removed the bar Y axis. Why? <laughs> see what I did there. So it's because I added those data labels a little bit while ago. Um, and now that we have those labels, we really don't actually need a Y axis. If you really want one, I would suggest just putting the zero and the very top number to show the range. But other than that, you, you really don't need it. I also removed the X axis on the line chart of the months. And this is because it's redundant. I've positioned those line points exactly above the corresponding bars below. So I feel you don't actually need to repeat those months to understand what's happening when. Now the next thing is to increase the font size. So it's a little bit more readable if this is a line, uh, I'm sorry, if this is a live presentation. There's a little bit of wiggle room when you are doing this as a dashboard or printing this out and sending it, but you just want to make sure that it's readable at whatever capacity your audience is going to be consuming it. I also need to adjust some of these data labels on the line chart. They're sort of overlapping. But what I actually did is I just kept certain line labels. I don't think you really need all of them. I think it's important for the bars because someone will want to know how much money there is at any one time. But for the line chart, what I like to do for that is I keep the minimum, the maximum, and the current performance. I think this is enough context to help understand what's happening currently. Now, the next thing I also do is I add target next to that line. I want to make sure people fundamentally understand what that is. And now, this is the really tough part. I've changed all of my data to a neutral gray, and I've changed the target to black. I want those different pieces to coordinate between the two charts. It's very important. Um, that way, I don't necessarily need a color legend. And this way, all of the information sort of fades to back and allows us to emphasize what we need. So now that you've seen the little picture, we can see the big picture. So if I had to do a similar view of what was handed to me with the, the four modules, this is what I would suggest doing initially. This looks familiar uh, to what was originally sent, so it could help with transitioning people to a new view. But now, at least, we can understand between the various charts how much revenue there is in any one time and what the growth looks like in comparison to the value. Now, the thing is, we've arrived at, even though it's the second letter in the name, it's the fourth letter in the process, and that is insight. So if you remember, we define insight as the capacity to gain an accurate and deep intuitive understanding of a person or thing. And unfortunately, I don't find my, most hearts do that, but with the right level of aesthetics and leading people through a story, I think we can do that. So I'm gonna take a step back and start with our target variance chart 
and start telling the story the way I see it. So really what we're seeing are that channels B and C are underperforming their 2016 targets. I've colored both of those a very muted brick red tone, a slightly different tone for each, but just showing that negative tone. If you wanted to highlight how well channel A and D are doing, you could do a very gentle, I would suggest neutral blue tone. I don't suggest green just because of the prevalence of um, colorblind lists in our organizations. So I know that's that could be a bit tricky, but that is what I would recommend. Now, taking this and leading into the target variance trend line that we had, we can see that channel B reached a low point in April. Now, again, this is all completely theoretical. I'm making this up as I go. But let's just say, you know, possible reason could be, well, we deactivated the Caribbean hotel campaign. So unfortunately, our growth in that area went lower. This is, again, how we're beginning to tell a story using a sequence of views. The next piece is channel C underperformed all of Q3. That was a really low point for that channel. So we took a little bit of a dig and we found, well, we redesigned our landing page, but it looks like it was unsuccessful in driving growth. So there is a little bit more of the story. So after taking all this in, I took a step back and I thought to myself, looking at this line graph, you know, there might actually be another chart type that could be a value in that large blown out view that we originally got. And that is called a small multiples. So small multiples are basically condensed line charts that um, are replicated across multiple segments. It's excellent for trying to understand what the same metric is across multiple segments to sort of compare them to each other, but not allow their performance to crisscross each other and confuse the way that sometimes a single line chart will do when all of those lines are overlapping and running into each other. So you can see here, we've started with those simple small multiple charts up above. The target line is the dotted line for each of those channels and we can see how far above or below the growth fell for that particular channel against its own target. Then what I did on the bottom, because we don't want to lose that volume context, is I added almost a sparkline bar, if you will, where each channel's revenue is reflected as a volume metric. But what I've done is I've replicated the scale across each of the channels. So now we can actually compare the overall volume of revenue to each other, if this makes sense. This answers an additional question is kind of how do you eyeball the volume against each other's channels? So, you know, taking in the big picture here, we can see that, you know, channel C is obviously the leader in terms of share of revenue. So that 2.1% growth, which was a dip below its target in May, could have actually had a severe impact on the overall target for the program versus for channel D, you know, you can see that volume of revenue is much lower. That 6.9% growth, which is still growth, but it was still well below the target line, that may be more inconsequential to the overall program. So I think this is a great way of answering all those questions and some additional ones with actually less ink on the page. So let's take a look at where we started. Oh yeah. And where we ended. I hope you'll agree that this is a cleaner way of seeing this information that actually answers additional questions that we didn't even know were there. So let's take a minute to quickly recap what we learned for today. The PICA methodology starts with purpose. Why does this visualization exist? And what is it trying to accomplish? Insight which is actually the last step. <laughs> so we'll come back to that one. Context, what additional views or information can we provide that paints a more complete picture of what's happening? And there's aesthetics, the visual cues that people need to comprehend properly. And then going back to insight, what is really coming out as the bottom line? What are we really learning here? 
Now, I am by no means saying that this is the only way or the best way for visualizing this information. This is just what I have come up with using the tools and the experience that I have at my disposal. But I would really love to get the conversation started with you. So I'm putting you on the spot and I'm asking you, how would you approach visualizing this information in one space? Or how would you improve upon or expand upon what I've done here? If you want to get in on the action, please leave a comment on this page and I'll show you where. And now it's your turn. I would love for you to submit your slides so I can tune them up and make them hum. It's totally free. And if you go to leahpeka.com slash makeover, you'll find a little form there where you can submit your files and there's all the rules and regulations. It's really not that many. And we'll make it happen and your work could be featured on the show. So definitely submit yours today. Welcome to the upgrade segment. Little power tip for using the tools of the trade to do our job awesomely every day. So today's upgrade tip is actually inspired by today's exercise because I found myself using this little tip a whole lot. And that is resurrecting removed chart elements. So you might have noticed that I actually like to remove a lot more than I like to add. That's intentional. But sometimes what happens is I may want to adjust the scale of an axis of a chart that I've already removed. And because I've removed it, I can no longer click on it to select it and modify it. But fear not, it's not gone forever. I'm going to show you how to bring it back from the dead. And I'm actually going to show you live in PowerPoint right now, but this will work for Excel also. So here is our target variance bar chart from before. So I'm going to click anywhere on the chart area. And now you can see that uh, the little dynamic menu up here in the ribbon. So I'm going to go to chart design. Now I'm going to go over to add chart element. And all of the elements that I'd like to add back are now listed for me here. So let's say I want to bring back my axis title for the vertical axis. I can do that just like that. Boop, there it is. And now I can edit it. And now I'm going to remove it anyway, <laughs> just for fun. So, so if you're just listening to this, you'll find all of the resources I've mentioned and the companion video to this on the show notes page at leahpeka.com slash 016. There's everything you'll find there. That's where you can also sign up for my newsletter if you'd like to get the chart detox checklist and where you can leave me a comment to let me know what you think about today's makeover. So if you like what you've heard today on the podcast, I would so love it if you could leave me a rating or review on iTunes. Ratings and reviews, super easy to leave. You just click on the button in two minutes you're done. But those ratings and reviews tell me that I am on the right track to delivering quality content to you. And they help me rank higher in iTunes because of algorithms and algorithms are just awesome. Who doesn't want algorithms? And as I said before, if you'd like to join my newsletter, you can find it at the bottom of each show notes page. Super easy to sign up. I give lots and lots of free content to subscribers that you'll not find anywhere else on the blog. And I'll leave you today with a little bit of presentation inspiration by the one, the only, Gar Reynolds, and that is, you can achieve simplicity in the design of effective charts, graphs, and tables by remembering three fundamental principles, restrain, reduce, emphasize. That's it for today. Namaste.